Amen. Happy anniversary. What a blessing that is. 40, how many years? 41. Praise the Lord. And uh, you may not know this or not, but uh, after having been in a few different churches and uh, over the years, it's a, um, you have a unique situation here. Normally when a pastor resigns, he leaves Dodge, gets out of town. And uh, you have uh, two men that, I, this isn't me bragging on them, this is the Lord, but two men humble enough for one to step aside and for one to still respect and for them to work together in one church. That's something unique. That's a blessing. And uh, praise the Lord for it. So I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of it. Amen. Anniversary Sunday. Man, that's always exciting. And you may remember the date. <laughs> That was just a joke, everybody. So uh, we just want to make sure everything is going along just great. Um, before I jump into the message, uh, I just want to share a story, an illustration, if you will, about Faith Promise Missions. And um, we, uh, we went to the Philippines in 1997. Not long after that, I met a gentleman, a pastor, a Filipino pastor by the name of Pastor Gilbert Tokero. And uh, Pastor Tokero... Uh, took over a church in the La Loma section of Quezon City, which is a part of Metro Manila. If, you're, if you go to the Philippines or you look up uh, Manila, there is one little city called Manila, probably four million, but uh, a little <laughs> in the Philippines, amen. And, um, but they, they grew from that city and just kept expanding, and then they'd have to start another separate kind of governing body over this area that started from a barangay, a, pur a puruk, and then a barangay, and then it went on from there. So anyway, there's like 23 little cities that make up National Capital Region, NCR. So if you say Manila to a Filipino, they normally think about Metro Manila, which includes all those cities. So uh, that's 20-some million. So it's a lot of people. Well, Mel Brown went there. Uh, he was out of Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, the Lord called him later in life to go to the Philippines to start a church. And he taught the people in the Philippines that God wasn't white. God's not brown. It's not black. It's not green, purple. <laughs> you know, any other color. He's God. And uh, he can bless any people anywhere on the planet. Now, the Filipino average income is about $1,000 a year. Okay, so just kind of keep that in your mind. When I met Pastor Tokero, he had taken over the church from Brother Brown, uh, age and health reasons. He'd gone back to the States. Brother Brown still comes. His wife's gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, at 80 plus, almost 90, he was back last year interning in one of the churches that they were affiliated with and just preaching away on the other side of the world. And I still love it. They work together. And anyway... Uh, I, I was preaching in Brother Tokero's missions conference years ago, and I, so I kind of keep track. I taught in his Bible Institute. My, when we lived in Manila, my staff were members of his church. And um, there was a lady that played the piano. She and my wife became great friends. Their, their style of playing was very similar. Uh, they look at the, the uh, page in the hymn book and see these few notes, and then they add about 500 more. I don't know where they come from, but their fingers find them. And so it just fills the sound out. It's wonderful, awesome, hallelujah, I love it. And uh, so anyway, Sister Odette, we didn't know a whole lot about her. At first we got to know her, and uh, she had never married. And uh, she was living in her parents' house, kind of taking care of them a little bit, but she was working a job. And so uh, we were back uh, on a trip, and Brother Tokero had Sister Odette give her testimony. Sister Odette began to pray about her faith promise commitment, and she had this little thing going on in her life. She needed a vehicle. She had been taking public transportation, getting rides from friends. But now uh, the traffic situation, the need for her to get back and forth to home to kind of help take her, care of her parents a little bit more. And uh, so she really needed a vehicle. And she began to pray. And uh, she set aside her desire for the vehicle. And she began to pray, began to pray. And uh, the Lord impressed an amount upon her heart for faith promise. 800,000 pesos. That may not mean much to you, but that's 16,000 U.S. dollars at an exchange of 50 to 1. 
That's $1,333 and change dollars per month to Faith Promise. Now, she had a better than your average job, obviously, in order to make that, but uh, to give that kind of money, but she was not a millionaire. So she's praying, and her mind is saying, well, you need a car. And her heart is telling her, obey the Lord. So it came time for Faith Promise Sunday. She filled out the slip, put it in. She went to work. The boss said, uh, Sister Odette, we're afraid you're going to leave our company and go to our competitors. So we're going to do two things. We're going to give you a raise and we're going to give you a car. Now, let me just ask you this, and I'm not being ugly or mean, but what's your story? Where, where and how can you tell your children, look at what our step of faith did. Look how our step of faith in obedience to the Lord was blessed by God. How many times did God tell the Israelites over and over and over, Rehearse these things into the ears of your children. Set up the memorial of stones. Bind them about where all these different ways. God kept hammering the Israelites to remind your children that God is big and God is good. And we need to follow him and trust him and obey him. Amen. Well, our kids don't just need to hear the commands and the laws. In a relationship, there's more than just commands and laws. There's blessings too, amen? And our kids need to hear about those. So that's not the message this morning. Joshua chapter 13, if you would. Joshua chapter 13. And uh, I love missions. Oh my. I've asked the Lord to call me back to the field and he hasn't. And so I'm staying at the field that I'm at. Amen? And um, we just love it. Faith promise. Uh, foreign missions. My brother Steve, you all know him. Uh, he has really stirred my heart in recent years about home missions, and, and uh, the need is just everywhere. And so thank God for churches that are involved in missions. Our missions conference is in February, and uh, this past year the uh, church went above what, we, what the amount the Lord had laid upon my heart to pray and, and seek Him and ask Him to give us. And so our, our church's faith promise, I think, will be 104,000, somewhere in that, that time frame or that uh, number frame. And so uh, we have 102, uh, we just took somebody on, so maybe 103 families that we support on a monthly basis. And um, now listen, when I went to Grace, I inherited a 500 and, yeah, about four ninety five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 debt. Thank God you're debt free. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so there are times when I've been uh, tempted and say, well, you know, let's not focus so hard on missions. Let's get this thing paid off. Uh, we've, got a, uh, we've got a parking lot that is like driving through the field with boulders. <laughs> it's terrible. And so I thought, well, if we could just take, uh, you know, this, all these, these funds coming in and just go ahead and take care of the parking lot. No, we can't do it. Lord's going to give us the parking lot at the right time. The, the debt's being paid off. But uh, we are not going to stop or slow down on the area of missions. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord for it. Joshua chapter 13. I want to read the first seven verses. And this morning, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I've been talking about all week uh, believing to see. And so that's coming from our perspective. But this morning, I want to just kind of pause button over there and and. The thought that was stirring in my heart is, what does God see? Now we've looked at what Bible characters have seen and how God has instructed us to see and how we should see, but God sees things too. And so I want to look at that this morning, and it's kind of in relation to the fact that this is an anniversary Sunday. But Joshua chapter 13, verse 1, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate that. <laughs> you ever notice that God's pretty blunt? Joshua chapter 1, Moses, my servant, is dead. There's just no beating around the bush. Isn't that a better way to communicate? Don't manipulate. 
Don't try to get people led into something or some direction that you want you to go, want you to, you want them to go in. Just speak the truth in love. Amen. Amen. It's good stuff. Thou art old <clears throat> and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth. All the borders of the Philistines and all Geshurai, from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even under the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites and the Ashdathites and the Eshkelonites, the Gittites and the Ekronites, also the Avites. From the south, all the land of the Canaanites and Moreah, that is beside the Sidonians unto Aphek to the borders of the Amorites and the land of the Giblites, and all Lebanon toward the sun rising from Baal Gad under Mount Hermon unto the entering into Hamath. All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon unto uh, Misrephoth Mayam, and all the Sidonians, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance. As I have commanded thee, now therefore divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. Father, thank you, Lord, this morning once again that we can gather in your house. Lord, I pray that you'll use the word of God to speak to our hearts. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Somewhere along our lives, as we begin to grow into our more mature years, or still trying to grow into those years, amen. Uh, have you ever woke up one morning and realized I'm not as young as I used to be? Amen. I coached our basketball team in the academy for a while, and uh, we'd make it to the tournament, and we'd get down to the tournament, and these guys, they'd kill me. Uh, we'd go, and we'd, we'd drive three hours, leave early in the morning, get over to Baton Rouge, and start the tournament, start the games, and they'd play two or three games, and then we'd go over at this other church, a pastor friend of mine, they had a gymnasium, and, and uh, they'd turn a bunch of the classrooms there into prophets' chambers, and he'd let us camp out there so we didn't have to pay hotel bills, and so uh, these guys would get out there and play basketball and volleyball till midnight after traveling. And, and I'm sitting there watching them. I'm sure there was a day when I, when I used to do that. <laughs> that day is not today. <laughs> uh, the energy level, sometimes, uh, you know, it just seems to start to fade away. We have Joshua here that we know he is one of the, uh, one of the top men in Scripture. I mean, just a, a hero of the faith. And uh, great studies about his life and great things accomplished. And in a quick read of this passage, I, I believe sometimes I've taken it in the wrong direction. But the Lord began to show me some things from this passage. And I, I want to bring them in as to with this thought of what does God see? And we've, looking, we've been looking at different things all week out of Psalm 27. We started Wednesday night on the abundance of faith. Uh, we talked about the assurance of protection and how the Hebrew lads were in the burning fire and the things that they learned in the fire. Uh, we talked last night about the acceptance of waiting and, and how we are to wait. But while we're waiting to stay busy, to serve and to walk with the Lord in obedience. And, and that is something that isn't for seasons in our lives, but for the rest of our lives. And uh, this morning, though, I want to look at this thought of what does God see? I don't know about you, but sometimes the way the devil will trick or, or deceive or try to work on me is to say, you've been serving the Lord for a lot of years. To what end? What good has it done? Are you really making an impact? Is this really an, a lasting effect? And if you keep running down that road, you'll start to wonder, is it really worth it? The sacrifices, the hours spent, the time given. Now listen, I'm a visitor. I don't know all the stuff, but I know my church is probably no different than your church. And there are families in our church that are wonderful, love the Lord, but they struggle with the same thing for years. Amen. And as a pastor, sometimes I'm wondering, what else can I do? Is it working? Is it helping? Am I, am I doing the right thing? Saying the right thing? What else? What more? I don't think that's the right way to look at it. What does God see when he looks at our lives, at our ministry? He looks at the life of Joshua. He's having a personal conversation. 
And he says that, that Joshua is old, but it's not a condemnation. It's not a sentence. Amen. Amen. Let me share some thoughts. Number one, the age of Joshua. Um, we get to serve God, but we also live under the laws of nature, if you will. If evolution was real, we'd be getting better as we get older. We get better here, hopefully. And then we reach a point where we're not better here. Amen. What was I supposed to say next? <laughs> Two things that seem to go as you get older, your, your hearing, and then what, I forget what the other one was. <laughs> uh, listen, we don't get better as we get older. Our bodies succumb to the effects of aging. God saw that in the life of Joshua. He knows that about our lives. Senior saints, you're not washed up. You're not over the hill. You're not done until the Lord takes you home. Amen. There's something that everyone can do. Yes. Church is 41 years old. That doesn't mean the church is old. Man, I like the new. I, I, I pastor my church like it's still a church plant. I want something happening all the time. I want busyness and activity and function and things going and moving. Why? Because that means there's life. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, some folks grow old and quit. And I'm going to challenge you, church. Don't grow old and quit. Amen. I don't care if you fill every seat in this auditorium up. You're not done reaching Rapid City. Amen. It doesn't matter to me if your mission's budget gets to a million dollars a year. Oh, hallelujah. That's not enough. There's still more countries to reach. There's still more people that need to be given the gospel. There's still more John and Romans that need to be printed and shipped. There's still a need all over this planet. Don't ever reach the place where you say, well, that's it. I'm done. Paul said he finished his course when he was already locked up in prison. He's about to be beheaded. But until they took his head off, he was still preaching, still writing letters, still ministering and serving. Serving God, but still under the laws of age, uh, the laws of nature. Old age, listen to me, age should be a motive and not an excuse. Amen. I've got some senior saints in my church and sometimes Brother Butch Carson, he and Miss Dorothy, Miss Dorothy has MS, Brother Butch has all kinds of health issues going on. Every time I talk to him, he'll start apologizing. You know, I wish we could be there. I'm sorry, we just can't, you know... We, 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 we start to get ready Saturday night and, and my, my wife doesn't wake up Sunday morning. I just can't leave her here at the house by herself. And, and I said, Brother Butch, don't apologize. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not skipping church. Some people do. Some will skip tonight. That just tears my heart up to know I've got senior saints that would give anything to have enough health back to come to church. And we got some folks who could be in church and they're sitting home watching the ball game. It's convenient that Super Walmart is right next to our church, but it's also maddening because I drive by and their parking lot never suffers. Always got plenty of cars there. All during service times. Amen. All right, let's keep going. What I notice here is that there is this thought of preparing to leave work for others. God didn't call me to fix everything in Ocean Springs. He called me for a time frame and has given me a job to do. The church in Ocean Springs is not mine. It's the Lord's. If he tarries his return for a hundred years, I'm not going to be pastoring in a hundred years. Amen? I don't, I don't think I want to be pastoring at 150. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> wow. <laughs> So uh, what that tells me is this, the work is the Lord's. He told him in this chapter, we read the verses, I'm going to deliver these, these lands to you. What your job to do, Joshua, is just to divide them up. You do have a work, and even though you're old, there's still an assignment for you. But the work that is going to be completed will be completed by me one day. That's not yours to worry about. Sometimes we get overwhelmed looking at the need. Forget about the need. What's your job? 
Well, we've been knocking on doors for 41 years and it doesn't feel like we made a dent in Rapid City. It's not your job to reach Rapid City per se, but it is your job to do what God has called you to do. And through us, God can help Rapid City be impacted by the gospel of Christ. Perspective is so important. Prepare to leave work for others. I've got some young men in the church called to the ministry. And we get to talk and I start walking around sometimes outside and I'll say, the new building needs to go over here and we need to do this. And, we need, and I've got stuff in my mind for 20 years down the road. I don't know if I'll accomplish that. But I believe the Lord gave it to me. So I want people in the church family to know what direction the Lord has for us. Why? Because if I get taken home, somebody's got to carry this thing on. It's the same thing right here at Liberty. Amen. There's a work to do. You say, well, that's, that's the pastor's job and the pastor emeritus. That, you know, that's, that, no. Every piece of the family has a part. Every tribe had an assignment. They got an inheritance. Sounds great, but what was their inheritance? Go beat the inhabitants out. <laughs> Amen. And he, the, the Lord listed all out uh, those five areas, I believe it, 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 it was that we read. Uh, they were still inhabited. It was still battles to be fought and, and victories to be gained. And there would still be lives lost and casualties along the way. There was still a work. So we have, number one, the age of Joshua. Uh, his life was nearly over. The work was not accomplished. But Joshua was able to rest in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Number two, the appraisal of Canaan. <clears throat> so God looks at Joshua and tells Joshua his situation. And he looks up and sees Canaan and he, and he shares with Joshua what the situation was in Canaan. Still battles to be fought. Still ground to be taken. Listen, when you go out around in this community, there are still souls to be won. Amen. The next pastor of this church may not even yet be saved. Amen. We went to Bacola City in 1997, got, into, got a meeting in with the vice governor so we could get into the provincial jail, the way their system worked. And uh, when I go into a jail, I like to find the biggest, meanest, baddest dude because everybody listens to him. And if I can win him to Christ, then others are going to follow out of fear. I don't care. <laughs> but I'm going to gain a hearing ear because they're afraid of this guy. So I kind of, you know, I'm walking through the prison and I found out that the kingpin of Bacola Provincial Jail was no-no. Okay? So no-no? I know again I go out and mow. In the Philippines, you can ask them what they did. It's completely acceptable in the States. Don't do it if you work in prison ministry. But over there, they kind of brag about it. And they want you to ask. And so I just flat out asked him, Brad, what'd you do? And he said, well, I'm a gang lord. We had our gambling ring and the police tried to move in. And he said, uh, uh, the, the fourth police officer that I killed, I went into his house at night, took him out of his bed, tied him to a chair, killed him in the center of town so everybody could see him. Really? <laughs> it's quite a story. <laughs> so I said, uh, you're, you're basically admitting that you did it. So that's a good first step. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> he's not trying to deny guilt. And so we got to talking back and forth. And uh, he thought I was one of the uh, Catholic brothers coming in to uh, do whatever religious activities. And he found out I was a Baptist pre uh, preacher. And so I started preaching. He realized what I was about and he wouldn't come, wouldn't attend. So he was living in one cell. So I walked over and set up Bible study right in front of his cell. Started preaching. This guy got in a fight on purpose so he could have his cell transferred. I have more freedom than he does. All right, this morning we're going to transfer our Bible study. Everybody come with me. So we went. <laughs> it took me two years of preaching and working and finally no, no, and got saved. There's more to the story I'll, I'll share this evening. But in the, the jail system of the Philippines, when he got his sentence, because it was more than 12 years, 
He left the Negros Island of Bacolod City where we were. He was transferred up to Montelupa Prison, which is the federal pen for the whole, uh, the whole country. 30,000 man institution up there. And so uh, later on, I went up there and I was, we were starting a church. They let you lease property, build a building and have a church inside the prison. And so I was up there getting ready to start a church in this prison. And so we were saturating, taking John and Romans gospel tracts and all that throughout the whole jail, uh, the whole prison area. And uh, I'm walking along and all of a sudden I hear, Pastor! And I look around and there's all these brown faces staring at me. I couldn't make out anything. And finally, I found out it was no no. So he came running down from the third story of the dorm and, and uh, went with me holding the box. And we're passing out tracks. And he's telling people, yeah, take one of those. <laughs> they separated him by language group. So I was working with the Alongo group. And he was one of the kingpins in the jail up there in Manila. Amen. Listen. I'll share some more of the story tonight, but God greatly used no no to see many people come to know Christ as Savior. Amen. There's still work to be done. As God looks over Liberty Baptist Tabernacle, as the appraisal of this church takes place, do you know what I believe God sees? I believe that He sees potential. I believe that he knows there is, there is an inheritance for you. But I also believe that just like the Israelites, just as he told Joshua that day, there's still yet land to be acquired. There's still some issues and some strongholds in your life, in your family. There's still some bitterness held on in the hearts of people in this church. There's still struggles that go on that you should have had victory over already, but you're not yet there. There's still folks in this church, I believe, after listening to Pastor Brooks last night, that no religion, but do not yet have a relationship. You listen to me this morning. If you die without Christ, you're going to split hell wide open. God's not going to ask you if you were a member of Liberty Baptist Tabernacle. He's not going to ask you if you were baptized in 14 different churches. He's not going to ask you if you ever got the Citizen of the Year Award. He's going to look for himself to see, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? No name, no life. I shared my testimony off and on this week. I thought being a preacher's kid would get me into heaven. Helping on the bus route. Helping in junior church. Teaching Sunday school. Going out on Saturday and passing out gospel tracts. Inviting people to church. Winning a bicycle. In a Sunday school campaign. Praying a prayer and getting baptized. I thought all those things would get me into heaven. The prayer of faith, yes. But mine wasn't a prayer of faith. It was a prayer of fear. I didn't understand it. I didn't see myself as a sinner in need of a Savior. I just didn't want to go to hell. So I prayed a prayer. I didn't repent of any sin. And because I didn't repent, God didn't have to forgive me for anything because I wasn't asking him to. I don't know your heart this morning, but I know that your pastor's heart was troubled last night and burdened because of the thought that there might be one here in this church family that does not yet know Christ as Savior. If you died today, do you know for sure that heaven would be your home? I know the time is escaping. Let me be quick. If you're visiting this morning, please accept my apology and then come back when Pastor Brooks preaches. Amen. Because I'm not pastor here, and so don't gauge the service and everything by me, all right? The appraisal of Canaan. Um, so much more to go here. Hmm. Many battles fought, much ground to be taken. I believe that this list in Joshua chapter 13 was not a rebuke, but a call to action. Amen. Amen. Joshua had accomplished much, but stay focused. There's still more to do. Amen. I listened to the reading of the, the history of the church. There's been much accomplished already. Thank God for it. But the work's not done. That's not a rebuke. That's a call to action. 
That doesn't mean, oh, you didn't finish it when he was done or that person was done or that. No, that's not it. Here's the facts. God saw Joshua, saw his condition, saw his situation. But then God also lifted his eyes and looked at Canaan and gave his appraisal of the situation in Canaan. There's still work to be done. I don't like going places where I can't be a part of what's going on. You ever go and uh, make a hospital visit and you just stand there? Nurses come in, you know, they're doing something and family member may be doing something. You're just standing there. Let me step out of your way. I don't like that feeling. Sometimes I'll go into church and, and I'll see something needs to be done. I'll start doing people go, Pastor, no, we got this. You know, you're the pastor. You don't need to be doing that. No, I want to be doing that. I want to be involved. I want to have a part. I'm thankful that that's how God treats us. He doesn't just give assignments to those that mankind might deem worthy. We all get to be a part. Hallelujah. The appraisal of uh, Canaan, number three, and I'll hurry, the affirmation of help. The promise of God was given at a particular time. Joshua, you're old. I'm going to fight the battles. Think of the assurance that was to the heart of Joshua. He knows he's worked, he knows he's served, but he also knows that he's old and stricken in age. He doesn't know what the next leader is going to do or how it's all going to play out. He's a human being. He doesn't see the end from the beginning like God does. But God reassures Joshua and says, there's help and I'm the helper. Amen. I'm going to fight the battles. Yes. Sometimes as a pastor, you look at needs in the church and you think, well, you know, maybe this family can do this or I wonder if they're ready and I was, in a, uh, I was having a personal conversation with Dr. Garris one day years ago, and we were talking about getting things going in the Philippines. I believe this was 98 or 97, one or the other. He was in over there on a trip, and he looked at me and he said, Brother Paul, if you're going to lead men, you've got to let them fail sometimes. You can't fix everything for them, and you can't do any, everything for them. You've got to let them be led of God and Sometimes fall. If you have children, how do you teach them how to walk? Sooner or later, you got to let go of mom and dad. And they usually fall down. Boom. Thankfully, they got lots of padding. It doesn't hurt them. Amen. <laughs> and get right back up and start going again. Hallelujah. Now, listen. The need was still great. The need was still there. Joshua hadn't accomplished everything. So that's motive, not rebuke. That's God saying, listen, every generation to come, when, I got, when, when God called me to preach, I'm thinking, man, I, I got to get into full-time ministry. I got to get there. I got to get there. I gotta. When I went on to staff at the church in Ocean Springs, I, I got to get full-time, got to get full-time. When I went to the mission field at 29, I was light years ahead of these guys that went to college, graduation, marriage, deputation showed up on the foreign field, and they'd never led in a ministry by themselves hardly at all prior to that. They're getting to know each other on the mission field. That can be a struggle. How do you start a brand new church? First time trying to figure it out on the mission field. So my, my perspective and mindset was, I got I to gotta conquer the known world, amen. And we got to reach the world for Christ and revival sweep across the world. And if uh, I got to get it, I got to start now. No, there's a job for me to do right now. Then there's going to be a job for me to do later. And then there's going to be another job after that. And all I have to do is walk by faith and obey him all the way through. Amen. Hallelujah. God sees what we leave unfinished. Unfinished labor can be finished by God. Now, that's not an excuse for us to be lazy and not do. But it is our job to do what we can do. That means that we don't have to overburden ourselves. Oh, what if I try my best and, and this family doesn't get it and, 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 and my loved one, uh, you know, I, I've got a burden for them and they're not yet saved. And what if I'm not the one? And it, It's not our job. Our job is to be faithful. So plant the seed, water the seed, pray. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the one that is going to give the harvest. The fruit will be reaped. 
that's God's responsibility and he'll do it. And church family, as we believe to see this year, as we look around and we, we wonder about the political climate and the, and the health climate, all the stuff going on around us, where do we all fit in? How do we believe to see? Understand this, God's seeing some things too. It's not just our perspective. Our church didn't run, hasn't run buses yet. We haven't started back. And there's a part of me that's all tore up inside because, you know, what about the kids? What about getting them to church? Our location and the things that go on, we're going to start next month and get them rolling again. We've been praying. I've been meeting with the men. But it, what I have to do is obey the Lord, not try to figure it all out in myself. God sees the situation. He knows what the need is. God knows that there's still all kinds of ocean springs that needs to be reached. So what do I have to do? I have to find one no-no. Pray and ask yourself, Lord, give me a soul this year. Let me lead one person to Christ this year and disciple them. And see what God does. God sees some things as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Lord, I pray that you'll use the simple thoughts from the life of Joshua to be a challenge to us, to encourage us along the way. No matter what spot or place in the journey we are, Father, I pray that you would keep our hearts encouraged. Lord, help us not to focus on results as the meter of whether or not things are going right or well. But Lord, help us to focus on, am I walking by faith? Am I living in obedience? Am I doing now what God has called me to do? Father, help our focus to be what you see, to be in line with you. Use us, Father, I pray. And again, Lord, I ask if there's one here today who's never trusted Christ as Savior, Father, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Bless now we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.